Presidente Duque, Minister Caro, General Coordinator General Coordinador eh, eh, Gregorio Díaz, eh, mi amigo, eh, Secretary General Moreira, Deputy Director General Gorson, Ambassador Clowder. Thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of the Inter-American Development Mac, it's really my privilege to welcome all of you to this event on the alignment with the Paris Agreement, or rather, I should say, the ways in which we are working across our region to respond to the world's expectations. I think that we need to move beyond pledges, and instead, you know, we need to spark decisive, emboldened action for one and only planet that we live on, and that's what we're here for to do. Over the past year, the IDB has really channeled urgency into impact, pursuing climate action more aggressively, being more innovative, and with a more business-friendly, market-oriented approach than at any time in our history. And in response to the request of our member countries, of our borrowing nations, of our clients, our organization has really taken on the mantle of climate change so that we can share, share how our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, can really safeguard its future in the face of growing challenges. We know that the pandemic has hit our region harder than any other in the world. It's the highest per capita death toll in the world and the worst GDP contraction in two centuries. Like the pandemic, climate change is presenting challenges daily where eight of our countries have been ranked amongst the world's 10 most at risk to its effects. In the last few years alone, our region has experienced some of the warmest temperatures on record, along with historic droughts, forest fires, and hurricanes. Latin America and the Caribbean contributes less than 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. But unless global warming is limited to less than 2 degrees Celsius, the region is going to suffer damage that could reach $100 billion annually by 2050. And it could also add 30 million migrants as a result. And indeed, when it comes to climate, what happens in our region doesn't stay in our region. It affects the whole world. Failure to act for us jeopardizes key global resources of water, food. It threatens to really unleash unprecedented migration crises, as I mentioned. Today, public budgets are extremely tight after fiscal measures to cushion the blow of COVID-19, but it's also a fact that climate action is highly compatible with economic growth. It's a win-win, and I'd add another win because it creates jobs. With the right fiscal policy, decarbonization of our region's economies can create 15 million net new jobs by 2030. And as I shared this morning at the World Leaders Summit, every million dollars that's spent on nature-based investments creates more than 10 times the number of jobs that the equivalent investment in fossil fuels does. So this has to be it has to be our region's green growth moment, our chance to really come back cleaner, more climate friendly and more sustainable after the pandemic to create jobs, prosperity out of this existential challenge. And that's why in the IDB's Vision 2025, which is our plan for regional recovery and growth, it enshrines climate action as a central pillar and why we have our climate change action plan, which really lays out concrete set of steps for us to continuously raise our, cli our own climate ambition and lead by example. Today, I'm proud to announce that the IDB will align all new operations with the Paris Agreement by 2023. And with our board of directors, we will work to design a new pathway for a more ambitious goal, pushing past our current annual floor of about $5 billion to a total of $24 billion in climate and green finance in the next four years. That's 50% more than in the previous four years. As part of our historic push to better tap into private capital, we're gonna to aim to really significantly higher the total when factoring in mobilizations in that regard. So it's gonna be a scaling multiplying effect. We have an action plan to achieve these commitments. We built it on technical expertise, new innovative financial tools, some of which obviously I'm gonna describe in a moment. So I encourage you to learn more about the objectives in this position paper, which we have prepared for this conference and which you'll be able to see online and elsewhere. These are the commitments are built on the trust vested in us, the IDB, by our borrowing member countries. So it was really one of the greatest honors of being here in the last two days was, was participating in the launch of Colombia's long-term strategy for the Paris Agreement compliance, which we call E2050. The IDB is proud to have played a part in this historic accomplishment for Colombia and for our region. And I'm also delighted today uh, that we're going to have with us Minister Cattle from Barbados, who's going to be with us virtually. By the end of 2021, 75% of our regional member countries will have presented their updated nationally determined contributions with IDB support. Barbados called on us for assistance and delivered its updated NDC in July, really aspiring towards a fossil fuel free economy by 2030. And they can count on the IDB throughout the implementation phase of this. At the Leticia PAC Summit last year, our member countries from the Amazon also requested that we devise sustainable development models for this precious part of our planet. And at our 2021 annual meeting in Barranquilla, the IDB launched our Amazon initiative with a really focus on the region's bioeconomy, on sustainable management of agriculture, livestock, forests, human capital, sustainable cities, and infrastructures. We recently announced the Green Climate Fund's new $600 million Amazon Bioeconomy Fund, which will be one of our key financing instruments for our Amazon fund at the IDB. And we just created a devoted Amazon unit at the IDB to help ensure the implementation so we can meet those goals of action. So I'm delighted 
to share that this week also two of our European member countries will announce contributions to our Amazon work. I'm gratified as well, and this is key, this is key to the success of this initiative, that Gregorio Diaz is with us, who's the general coordinator of COICA, a distinguished representative of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon who are on the front lines of climate change. We're gonna go from this from a micro to macro perspective. The IDB looks forward to strengthening our partnerships, to learning with you uh, and with the Amazon communities, and we look forward to these common, common goals. Also, Secretary General Moreira, who's going to be with us from the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. She's going to be with us virtually as well, alongside all of the countries of the Amazon. ACTO, as you know, the organization is a key partner for implementing sustainable development in a region that is really home to the largest continuous tropical rainforest in the world. At the recent annual meeting, the board, the bank's governors, ask for our assistance to mainstream climate considerations and funding, really, into the agendas of policies of these finance ministries. And indeed, we believe that we need to help these ministries rethink tax strategies, allocations, and view every reform as an opportunity to accelerate that transition to low carbon economies. Today, I'm also excited to announce the launch of the Climate Change Platform for Ministries of Economy and Finance. It's gonna be a vital step to enable planning, budgeting, the exchange of fiscal strategies for adaptation, mitigation, green growth. Deputy Director General Gorson from Germany, we're also happy to have you with us as well today. And I know you have an exciting announcement to make on behalf of the German government that's really gonna help the IDB achieve the goal of greening our region's fiscal policy. And I'm also eager to hear from another friend, Ambassador Clowder from the UK, who has been a steadfast ally to our region, his aspirations on climate action and to the IDB. And speaking of finance, this is an area in which really the IDB has distinguished itself in the past year. We're really determined, beyond determined, to be on the cutting edge of designing and employing the incentive market-driven mechanisms to help close the gaps for the, ambitious, for the ambitions of the region. I'm also pleased to announce several new initiatives that exemplify this. We pioneered and we've pioneered the green bond market in our region and alongside our private sector arm, IDB Invest, we launched a green bond transparency platform this April, which is a digital tool that will boost investor conference. This week, IDB Invest is issuing the very first blue bond in Latin America and just the 10th globally. The proceeds from that is going to support ocean and freshwater conservation projects in our region. We're really more focused than ever on crowding in private financing for climate fight, an essential and really mostly untapped pool of resources that we will need to take us really from the billions to the trillions of dollars investments for the region in ESGs. One of our most innovative tools is blended concessional resources for de-risking through instruments including debt, equity, grants, and by these means we're enabling investment projects that would not be bankable otherwise. Using these tools, IDB Invest achieved a record almost $2 billion in climate finance committed last year, not including more than $4 billion in core and catalytic mobilization. One of the truly, and I'm super proud of this, Groundbreaking steps we have taken in the recent launch of a brand new asset class, which we've helped create, which is soon going to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Leveraging the power of the market, countries, companies alike, all of this can now be compensated for their nature positive engagement. IDB Lab first incubated this radical idea, and thanks to IDB Project, Costa Rica is soon going to be one of the first to offer this natural capital on this new exchange. Last month, we approved the creation of a special purpose vehicle in Peru to direct funding through financial institutions for bioeconomy businesses that support climate positive investments. And this week, IDB Lab is announcing our region's first microfinance fund for climate change adaptation, which we expect to help 20,000 rural farmers in Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, and Central America so they can sustainably adapt to rising temperatures. As you know, the IDB led the multilateral development banks in presenting today uh, our joint statement on nature, people, and planet, and I'm really excited about that. I've also mentioned several of the tools that we're using to help place nature at the heart of the international financial system, and here's one more so I can wrap up. We're now designing innovative debt for nature swaps and debt for nature bonds in several of our countries, which is also gonna be game changing. We're really determined to lead in the face of this unprecedented climate challenge. No country organization can do it alone. Partnerships have never been as critical as they are today, and that includes the work with all of you here, as well as the new collaborations that we're excited to announce. Let me just give you one of them. We're now part of the Rockefeller Foundation's new Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, and together we're gonna to establish an Energy Access and Energy Transition Trust Fund for our region, which can be game-changing. We also look as to we're gonna be signing soon a Memorandum for Understanding with the Secretary for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, better known as UNFCCC, and this pays the way for better coordination and mutually reinforcing work as we help our borrowing member nations chart a net zero future. We came to Glasgow to lay down a new market for ambition, innovation, resource, and armed with our expertise, resources, maximizing mobilizations, collaborating with our partners. We're motivated by this urgency and the major opportunity before us. We're going to continue paradigms on climate action and we're going to break them all and we're going to be determined to be at this critical junction in the region's history and the start of a new and green generation. And I'm sorry for speaking so fast, but that's what I do. Thank you so much. Now, for the real 
uh, important part, discussing with the panelists uh, the situation. And I cannot have a greater friend, partner, uh, there cannot be a greater le leader in the region on this issue than President Duque of Colombia. Estimado Presidente Duque, Nuevamente es un honor contar con ustedes en este panel. Really is a an honor to have you here with the panel. panel. Could you just describe a little bit about uh, your leadership? Uh, we know that Colombia has made uh, significant uh, advances in uh, promoting uh, sustainable uh, development. And share with us your vision, your perspective regarding uh, Bueno, Mauricio, uh, as your uh, role as a, as a uh, partner with the IDB. Well, thank you very much, uh, President. And it really is an honor. I want to thank the panelists as well. I'm very excited seeing and just hearing your words, the uh, uh, President, because we know that the IDB is always uh, in the uh, forefront in terms of energy uh, development and innovations, working on also protecting uh, the environment and also achieving uh, carbon neutrality, which I believe will be very positive in protecting the biodiversity of the planet and ecosystem. So Colombia does have a story to tell as well. We have uh, made major strides in terms of renewable energy sources. It's made a quantum leap now with uh, green uh, initiatives next year. We already have established new protected areas. In fact, just a few minutes ago in areas, uh, protected areas, we're going to add 16 million square hectares to that area. We're also involved in economic recovery efforts after the pandemic. We are hoping that uh, the economy will grow at around seven, between seven and nine percent uh, annually. So we think it's a very optimistic and uh, very, uh, at the same time, um, we're very heartened by this. Now, what are we expecting with the IDB? Well, the IDB has been one of our major, in fact, a major partner in the region. And um, as Enrique Iglesias had said, this is a friendly bank, a bank that uh, works with us, but the demand for resources is going to be significant. We know today that we are going to have to seek resources to help us, not just to get out of this pandemic in terms of infrastructure, telecommunications. We're also going to have to energize the climate uh, responses. And this leads me to the major point of our discussion about the need that we have to capitalize on the resources offered by the bank. About a decade ago, we were involved in the negotiations with that ninth capitalization of the IDB so that the bank could take on new challenges with necessary resources. And uh, we, they helped us and it helped uh, the region to get out of the crisis of 2009-2010. Well, now more than a decade has elapsed and we continue to see the bank expanding in capital and its uh, efforts. So I think the key challenge that we have to assume today has to do with the urgent capitalization, need for capitalization by the bank, which means that all the countries in the region need to contribute their part Today, more than ever, we need to be realistic. This capitalization has to take place as quickly as possible, and that's going to depend on a large supply of resources, not just with the na national governments, but also the regional and local governments in terms of climate action, energy response in the post-COVID agenda. Just let me conclude with the following comment. Today, more than ever, we also need that IDB lab to help develop new innovative tools in order to fund all of the efforts relating, relating to climate finance, the issuance of green bonds to work uh, for pay as you go in environmental services, also developing a nature-based solutions so that we focus not just on uh, um, forestry effort, uh, resources. We need to work together with the indigenous communities as well as small farmers, create these cooperatives. At the same time, we want an IDB invest that will provide that support for businesses in terms of achieving greater carbon neutrality and assuming new commitments to provide uh, better resources for collective interests. So everyone within the IDB group family is looking at opportunities. What do we need to do to ensure that these opportunities grow and can be distributed throughout the regions, including uh, the uh, debt uh, for nature swap you were talking about with countries? So the bank can be uh, appropriately capitalized. So in Colombia, we are focused on supporting that capitalization of the IDB. And President Claver, this needs to be a message 
clear to all of the nations in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, not just in the region, but worldwide in these areas. And we were d discussing about how there's going to be uh, enough uh, resources. Just about every panel that we've look, been looking at has been discussing these areas, uh, these issues. So it really is a pleasure. Thank you very much and an honor to have you as part of that uh, support. Minister Cattle from Barbados, who is with us today. Minister Cattle, your leadership has really been impressive at Barbados and, and PM Motley. Uh, what, what, what a wonderful uh, speech she gave uh, in the floor. It has proven the importance of having island states underline the need for increased adaptation finance and most importantly, of ensuring innovation. We at the IDB supported the update of your NDC this year, and we're supporting your Roofs to Reefs program, which is a tool that really serves as a guideline to prioritize investments. So please, would you mind sharing with us your plans for execution? Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with my distinguished fellow panelists. A few years ago, Barbados realized that in some ways, countries in the region had become complicit in the world's failure to meet its commitments to address the scale and speed required to respond to the climate crisis. And how was that? We were conceptualizing and accepting support for small sectoral, sometimes pilot projects that had some environmental target, but small environmental or resilience impact. We were complicit in a model that said small pockets of technical assistance resources were all that was required for our countries to adapt to rising sea levels waves of sargassum seaweed that were killing our marine life, more intense hurricanes that wiped out 220% or more of our GDP, and storm surges that destroyed our coastal infrastructure. So we wrote Roofs to Reefs to demonstrate and address the fact that from the safety of people's roofs and shelter in a disaster to the sustainability of our water infrastructure in a country that is among the top 15 water scarce countries in the world, to how we protect our reefs, to how we realize nutrition security while protecting our biodiversity, small projects executed separately with little clear impact would not work. They never did. We needed scale. The Roofs to Reefs program concretizes what we mean by resilience and sustainability. It is integrated, which makes it efficient. It is comprehensive, which makes it effective. But all of this also makes it expensive. Our preliminary estimate is that Roofs to Reefs will cost at conservative estimates $2.5 billion. This is, of course, beyond the capacity of the government's balance sheet. The real gap today is not of understanding the challenges we face. It is not about a neglect of natural capital. It is not technical. It is financial. And the time for worthy but unfunded pledges is over. This is a time for action based on clear investment plans. My ministry is responding to this investment challenge by looking at the core ingredients of Rooster Reefs and dividing it into three groups. First, we can incentivize the private sector by setting policy right, making the policy regime clear and specific and making application processes streamlined, efficient, and where possible, even unnecessary. One example of this is our time-limited attractive feed-in tariffs for renewables, approved by the Fair Trading Commission and announced in February leading to applications for 70 megawatts of solar PV, which would represent almost 10% of our base energy needs. The second category of our roof series projects is those things we could do through a public-private partnership. We know that to progress these projects, we need to develop the right policy regime. We can also find ways of improving the credit quality of the government income stream that keeps it off our balance sheet, but is more attractive to private sector investors. We talk a lot about de-risking, but there's no amount of de-risking that will work unless we address a financial regulatory regime that has very fixed definitions of what is safe and what is risky. So that any company in any country, no matter its performance, can never have a higher credit rating than the rating of that country. And so that means that our task is to get or create an agency defined as safe or with better credit ratings to offer second loss guarantees in our income streams that keep the private sector with important skin in the game keen, but that limits their losses. We recognize that the challenge will be for small local firms to participate in these two categories of projects. But without their participation, the development impact of these projects will be limited. And we are not interested in any development 
that does not bring people along. So we'll also, we'll, we'll also need accompanying programs of technical support and some help with the required risk capital to take projects from good ideas to investable. Contrary to what most economic models have told you, the government often has more risk appetite than the private sector in small economies like Barbados. Still, we would rather do this within a program of technical support and co-investment. And this is one of the reasons that we are establishing a new green bank, potentially with the Green Climate Fund, that will operate commercially and take calculated risk in the private financing of rooster reefs and similar programs. The third and last category is all of the rest, all of the rest of the projects under the program. The public sector will have to execute some parts of roofs to reefs because there are no income streams or because the social impacts are substantial, they're hard to capture and monitor, and they're best managed by those who are seeking to maximize people's well-being, the state. Even this category will likely have a more significant impact if we can progress projects in the other two categories alongside them. But this too requires a new financial model. When Prime Minister Motley spoke in the opening session yesterday, she pointed out that we are 20 billion short of the 100 billion annually. We are 25% off the 50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation. But more importantly, she pointed out that those targets do nothing to meet the scale and urgency required of this moment, to meet the real gap of 2.5 trillion annually that faces us all, but that is more glaring for frontline states like Barbados. For this third category under roofs to reefs, for the adaptation that the state must undertake, the need to close that gap through increased special drawing rights and reallocation of SDRs in a trust for adaptation becomes even more urgent and obvious. There's tremendous scope here for IDB to partner with us on new models of investment, and we look forward to continuing the conversation so that rooster reefs can be a model for realizing a just balance of adaptation and mitigation. Thank you so much, Minister Cattle. And I, that's super interesting. And, and of course, we look forward to the implementation phase and the partnership that we've had in order to strengthen it. And we remain ready to support you as, as you catalyze additional resources. Now, it's also a pleasure to speak with the Coordinator General of COICA. Your role in the design of the Amazon initiative has been key. So how do you look at this with regards to uh, working with the co-creation of the implementation and also co-processing uh, and implementation? Well, I want to thank everyone for all of you throughout the world that are watching us. I want to thank BID IDB Lab for this opportunity for the Amazon region, for the, uh, the First Nations, the indigenous communities. It's also an honor to be here with the minister from the uh, UK, uh, Mr. Uh, minister Caldwell from the uh, German uh, government. And we also had one of the uh, presidents of the uh, Amazon uh, region of lugar, nations, eh, the president of Colombia. So for us to begin with, it really is a a hope. And at the same nación. time, this constitutes a major initiative. It's a hope on the one hand, because we hope that this uh, process will uh, unfold in various uh, phases. And by 2025, we can go way beyond the expected horizon and also with the vision of safeguarding the indigenous communities, the biodiversity, our water resources in the Amazon region. And I know that this is the proposal by COICA and we agree on this uh, vision and mission. And for us, we see many opportunities arise. This can become programs, a series of programs, and a model that includes the engagement of uh, diverse actors that also have a very important responsibility in the Amazon uh, basin from an economic, social, legal perspective, from a political perspective. And I think that, first of all, asking all of you to achieve that solidarity. I think we are moving with, through various nations toward the create, working with the uh, multilateral uh, institution like uh, the IDB, working with the Amazon uh, Basin region. And after these uh, announcements, we will meet 
to see exactly how these visions that are for 2025 can become a reality. And if I may, I would just like to ask all of you that in this, within this space, within the um, the agreement that we hope that this experience will be able to fit within this because in the Amazon Cooperation Treaty, which is that space where all of the governments cooperate and work together, and we hope that this initiative can link up with the support of Germany, with the support of the UK, and I think this would link up to create a significant, a major initiative. The IDB currently is supporting and promoting and providing an opportunity for all of us. And the commitment is that this dialogue, this proposal should be developed and built jointly including the bank's vision, the vision of the nations in the region, so that the Amazon can continue to be a major uh, resource for the planet. And we are calling on the nations that make up the uh, Amazon region and the Amazon Cooperation Treaty join us. We need to join together so that we can become even stronger. And we believe that this response, this proposal, the hope that I was talking about, and we're already involved in the process to turn these hopes into a reality. And we have now given our word to move forward in this constructive effort uh, toward 2025. Well, I know over the last few days in our discussions, I've learned a great deal, and I am I trust that we will be able to move forward together in, uh, in a, 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 an effort to continue to create jointly these opportunities for the Amazon region. Now, we have Secretary General Moreira. We're going to discuss a little bit more that we know that the Amazon region is a priority for the bank. And thank you for joining us. Could you discuss how do you view new business uh, agreements and initiatives Okay, in the terms gracias. of the green economy. Thank you very much, Mauricio, and special greetings to President Ivan Duque and the other panelists. The vision, regional visual has a lot to do with the strategies for the Amazon region. This larger ecosystem that is shared by eight countries, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela, requires permanent, diverse, and scaled up solutions. We must understand that there isn't a single Amazon. There are several, several within the same biome. That is the only way for us to understand the different problems as well as the different actions that must be undertaken in favor of this major ecosystem. For instance, we have the forest Amazon. It requires policies and actions for restoration, reforestation, recovery, sustainable agriculture, agroforestry systems, amongst others. Then, on the other hand, we have Amazon under pressure with a lot of forests, but with different illegal acts occurring there, such as illegal occupation of land, illegal extraction of wood, illegal trade of species, illegal mining, and there need to be more measures and solutions for the control combat amongst others. Then we have the forested Amazon with high levels of poverty, development that is unequal, and scant opportunities for subsistence. The city of Amazon, with its own dynamic of urban centers that, for instance, in Brazil, it has been calculated that 80% of Amazon inhabitants are concentrated in the cities. Therefore, we also need to have an agenda focusing on cities, providing basic services such as water, sanitation, generating investments. In this context, we're working as the organization of the Amazon 
cooperation treaty and now in a strategic partnership with the IDB in two axes. First, focusing on the bioeconomy to implement actions, public policy, promote public-private financing at different government levels, including regional governments, in order to achieve the development of more responsible and economic use of biological diversity. The second pillar is a very ambitious and agenda in transport of waters with resilient infrastructure to adapt to climate change, focusing on water sanitation, solid waste in the framework of water security. Now, one differential element for the Amazonic countries basing on their potential based on the biological diversity is to take advantage of this major resource. These financial resources through the fund ought to be used to develop and strengthen knowledge that is based on science, applying technologies, innovation, and strategic planning to develop an economy that will maintain the forest and the standing forest and eliminate the mistaken paradigm of seeing the Amazon region as a producer of commodities for bio-industry occurring outside the borders of our own countries. Quite on the contrary, we need to move towards a deeply rooted bioeconomy, generating a local bio-industry that is diversified, generating high-value-added products, improving all the links of the productive chain, generating jobs, social inclusion, and taking into account and combining traditional knowledge and the knowledge of the indigenous peoples. This is therefore a productive transformation, developing high technology to promote national and regional competitiveness while also redefining a system for public and private investment incentives to generate multi-sectoral benefits with effect on what is economic, social, and environmental. This should be an opportunity for sustainable development, having an impact on reduction of inequality gaps. There are several examples in the region showing that uh, agroforestry system products, for instance, are far more lucrative than exhaustive land use that result in deforestation. One example is Acai here in Brazil. According to the data of the most recent social or corporate balance sheet of a Brava company, they had three trillion reales generated in the economy, generating an economic impact of over 144 million of reales in handling Acai in human and valleys, humid areas, and about 146 million reales in growing acai on solid ground. Acai has become a product that is known and consumed throughout the country. There is a very interesting market overseas also. Even more interesting when we look at the cost-benefit and investment relationship of these products. For instance, for each real invested in research and management of Acai, the company's benefit is approximately 45 reales. And for each real invested in crop research for Asai, the return is about 36 reales for the company. So Amazon countries are already producing this kind of product, such as coffee, cocoa, nuts, camu camu, amongst others. These can be scaled up to larger regional production levels. The fund, therefore, ought to focus on promoting such industries with products that have been demonstrated and that require a different type of intention, maybe improved innovation, or enhance productive change or seek larger international and global markets, among others. The fund will also have to provide support so that more assets in the Amazon biodiversity are discovered and industrialized in the Amazon area. It is here where investment in research, development, and local innovation is so important, and this will require both public and private investment. So the tools and procedures to be designed that will be successful in implementing the fund resources must take care of these differential needs, which are structural. This major movement of economic resources for the Amazon
on areas of enormous opportunity, create and strengthen solutions to value and preserve the wealth of the Amazon, the standing forest. And this in turn will generate conservation and use of the tremendous potential of biodiversity in a smart, responsible manner. This in turn will ensure the preservation of the water cycle that occurs in the vastest water basin of the world, protecting the ancestral knowledge as well as that of indigenous peoples. Mauricio, as the organization of Amazon Cooperation Treaty, we would like to have as soon as possible a meeting with the other countries in order to work between the IDB and ourselves precisely to develop these procedures and tools. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Secretary General. It is truly a pleasure to have you and your support for the implementation. And I stress that word, implementation of this initiative. Deputy uh, Director General Gorson. Thank you so much, sir, uh, Director General Gorson, for joining us. And, and, and look, you know, BMU is a crucial partner for the IDB and really we've trusted us to enhance the climate change agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean. You've also been a supporter of our fiscal policy agenda. We welcome, obviously, your insights. So please share with us the priorities in terms of fiscal climate policy that you would seek to see in Latin America and the Caribbean. And please tell us more about why Germany is investing in the future of our region. Mr. President Kleiber Corona, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. I really feel honored to participate in this event. Addressing climate change through fiscal policy measures is an important uh, topic for us, both domestically and internationally. In May this year, Germany has adopted its first sustainable finance strategy. The goal of the strategy is to mobilize investments that are urgently needed for climate action and environmental protection, while also addressing the climate risks that are increasingly relevant for the financial system. This makes the strategy an important lever for us to become climate neutral by 2045. Promoting sustainable finance and aligning uh, fiscal policies to Paris are important areas of our international cooperation as well and will help us to achieve the Paris goals. The strong partnership between Latin America and the Caribbean and Germany is essential given the region's great potential for innovative climate action and its fundamental role in achieving our common objectives laid out in, Paris, in the Paris Agreement. So just appreciate very much the announcement of Barbados to become climate neutral by 2030. Latin America and the Caribbean hold great, great potential for transforming economies towards carbon neutrality. For us, it is clear that we will continue to support the region in its endeavors to reduce emissions and become climate resilient. In particular, I'm very well aware of the condensed mega diversity in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is unparalleled. The conservation of the region's natural assets, and in particular its forests as the Amazon and the Colombian Choco, is paramount to planetary and human well-being. And that's why we also joined the Global Forest Pledge just a few minutes ago. These natural allies provide ecosystem services essential for both the further mitigation and greenhouse gas emissions and the adaptation to the effects of climate change. In the com coming decades, it will be important to increase climate ambitions in the region and develop concrete measures um, for achieving them. A radical increase in the availability of financial resources is crucial, including f private financial resources for achieving them. To reach this goal, public sector spending will be key in incentivizing and leading the way, but private investors must also be engaged and more deeply in new and innovative way, ways to bridge the financing gap. For this reason, I'm very happy to announce today, jointly with the IDB, the new Fostering Fiscal Policy for Climate Change in Latin America and the Caribbean Fund. This fund is going to be supported by my ministry's International Climate Initiative with a grant of 17.5 million euros and will be implemented by the IDB. The fund will support countries in the region to increase the transparency, effectiveness and efficiency of climate-related fiscal policies. In addition, it will facilitate the exchange of best practices in the region. My ministry's International Climate Initiative has been supporting partners in Latin America and the Caribbean since 20, 2008. 
in implementing climate action and preserving biodiversity and protecting forests. The innovative approaches of our partners are impressive um, and ranging from promoting renewable energies and energy efficiency to support ecosystem-based adaptation, including with indigenous people, to capacity building for financial sectors, sector actors. We strongly value this partnership and are delighted to showcase some of the International Climate Initiative's innovative climate finance projects in Latin America in a separate COP side event on Friday this week. Finally, let me take the opportunity to encourage the IDB to continue and further enhance its important work on climate change mitigation and ad adaptation in Latin America and the Caribbean to achieve our common climate goals. And having listened to you, Mr. President, I have no doubt that this will be your priority. priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director General Gorson, and thank you for, for the trust and the partnership that we have with Germany. Uh, it's extraordinarily important for us, for the region uh, in, in that regards, and for the commitment uh, to the region and to the cause of climate, and you can count on that commitment. And no better way to round out and conclude and close the circle on this conversation uh, then with Ambassador Clowder from the UK, who I've gotten to know uh, well throughout this process. And, and congratulations, first and foremost, to the UK uh, uh, for this COP26. 20, 20, uh, COP Clearly, organizing something like this amid a pandemic is not uh, easy, and you've really been touring the region. I've seen you everywhere. I saw you in, in, in Colombia, in the, the Leticia Pact, and you've been all over in Washington, everywhere throughout the region uh, and, and over the past months. And so for us, I think it would be really interesting to learn what are the main takeaways and how do you foresee uh, the Latin American and Caribbean countries playing a key role here in Glasgow during COP26? Well, thank you very much, Mauricio, for the opportunity to be here on, on this panel. Um, and it is an exciting time here in Glasgow at COP26. We have the world coming together. But I think what's even more important um, than this conference is what actually happens afterwards. And so the sort of visions that we've been discussing during this panel, uh, the leadership, for example, we're seeing from um, President Duque of Colombia, um, shows that there is a way forward. And ambition is one of the crucial things that we're trying to take forward here at COP26 with enhanced NDCs, nationally determined contributions to reduce emissions by countries, but crucially also their long-term strategies for their implementation. Because as we've also heard from Mr. Maddy and others um, here, the vulnerability of the region exacerbated by the terrible health, social and economic impacts of the pandemic, the vulnerability of this region is very high with regard to climate change. So our second objective here at COP26 on adaptation and resilience and the connection with nature is crucial and getting a greater focus on that and getting countries to prepare for that and looking also at partnerships with business and the role of the banks and other financial institutions into taking that forward. But even more fundamentally, we mustn't forget that at the heart of all this are people and being inclusive, involving people, uh, indigenous communities, people from all parts of society is very, very important both in the discussions on what we're doing about climate change, but crucially in the actions we take to improve people's lives. And so it's also been very good to hear um, from my colleague in Germany uh, about um, uh, funding and future fiscal policy and the initiatives that are being taken forward by the IDB. Because my observations of being uh, involved with the region for many years, and particularly over the, the last year in our preparations for COP26, um, we've all been very good on, in our various Zoom meetings in analysing the problems. But it's how do we turn that into action? How do we turn it into urgent action? So we're already hearing some very important declarations coming forward um, here at COP26 in Glasgow both at national levels on uh, the contributions of individual countries, but also collective commitments. For example, we've seen over 100 leaders sign up today um, to the Declaration on Forests and Land Use. And that's so important for the world. It's particularly important in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so we also talk a lot about the threats from climate change we have to be realistic about our changing world and about the future impacts.
but also, as you, Marisa, have said, we also need to look at the opportunities. Because not only is there the challenge of a generation here, there's also the opportunity of a generation. Opportunities to look for green growth, opportunities to look for social and economic change, to create better lives for many, many people across the region, as well as addressing the challenges to come from climate change. So I very much welcome um, the inspiration, the leadership, the vision of all the countries here at COP26. Very much welcome the very wide range of participation that we're seeing here at, at COP26. Um, but also it's, it's about governments, it's about civil society, but also it's about the private sector, it's about the banks, financial institutions, it's about business. And we are all in this together and we can all make a difference. But what we need to do is focus on action and planning now on how we implement the many important initiatives that are being discussed here at COP26. Indeed, Ambassador, and the time for action is now and partnerships are more important than ever. So thank you all for your, your insight and, and for partnering with the IDB and the trust that you place in us on climate action. My hope is that together, obviously, in this partnership, we're going to be able to really look back at COP26 as really the start, as you mentioned, the start of a transformative action on sustainable development that our people and the planet need. So thank you again, and obviously, I wish you a successful conference, and thank you for joining us.